Thanks, uh, Tim, and good morning um, on behalf of the team here to everybody, and thank you for taking the time to dial in this morning. We will be referencing and walking through the uh, FY23 H1 results presentation that was uploaded to the ASX this morning. Before we dive into that presentation, just a couple of opening re remarks. It is, it's just over six years since I group listed, and suffice to say, it's been a period of significant growth for the business. Since December 2015, and notwithstanding the impacts of COVID, which we managed uh, very well as a business, notwithstanding the impacts, we've consistently and effectively executed on our strategic roadmap that from our perspective has been well articulated and communicated. We delivered on our financial forecasts with our growth underpinning a solid return to shareholders. And throughout, we've continued to maintain a strong balance sheet, which continues to put us in a position to pursue future growth initiatives. So it's been uh, a very exciting and full six years of which um, seems to have gone by very quickly. So this morning, we're very pleased to present our results for the first half of FY23, and certainly a, a half of significance given the acquisition of major competitor Avato, and the results for the half being well up over PCP. So if we can just look at the dashboard snapshot of the financial performance for the first half on page three, I won't go through all of them in detail because we'll talk to them through the through the course of the presentation, but suffice to say, across revenue, EBITDA, NPAT, EPS, and uh, the dividend, uh, all up significantly over PCP, which is uh, very pleasing and encouraging. So we'll uh, spend the rest of the presentation uh, diving a little deeper into those metrics and at the end, I'm happy to answer any questions people may have. So at this point, I will hand over to our CEO, Matt Aitken, to, to take us through the financials and the PL, commencing with page five. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so revenue, as you can see here, revenue has increased 31.4% to almost $503 million, up from $382 million PCP. Uh, the Avado business that we acquired in the middle of September last year has contributed $61 million of revenue through that three and a half month period in the active display group and AFI branding acquisitions that we completed in November 2021 have contributed a further 21, $25 million of additional incremental revenue over PCP. Good organic revenue growth for the half and that was around 9% and reflects a further incremental uplift in activity post COVID-19 with strong new business momentum, um, fantastic high levels of, of client retention and ongoing cross-selling across the group's very broad product and service offering. Revenue growth was broad-based, particularly strong uh, growth was achieved through our brand activations business, which you may formerly have known as retail display and our logistics and third-party uh, logistics component fulfillment business as well. Revenue associated with travel and tourism and event-related merchandise sales improved. Uh, further during the period, but still remains below those levels that we saw pre-COVID. Turning to page six, talking about margin or looking at margin, material profit margin was 44.2%, and this is down from 47.5% PCP. And that was primarily due to the business mix through the half, including the onboarding of the Avato revenue at a lower margin and a higher proportion of outsourced revenue, particularly in our brand activations business. So although the Avado revenue generates a lower margin than the broader group, incremental Avado revenue is expected to generate an uplift in EBITDA margin once operating synergies are captured post-completion of integration. Increased input costs, including paper, freight and consumables also contributed to the pressure on margin. However, these increases are passed on to clients over time. And although margin decreased relative to PCP on an underlying basis and excluding Avado, EBITDA and NPAT margin were broadly in line with PCP. And looking at EBITDA, this has increased 17.7% to $65 million from $55.2 million PCP, excluding a $4.4 million contribution from Avado, underlying EBITDA growth was 9.8% driven by the uplift in revenue. Net finance costs were $5.7 million compared to $3.9 million PCP, 
or $3.3 million compared to $2.2 million PCP on a pre asb 16 basis. Increased net interest expense reflects the higher net debt driven by our additional working capital through the period and the higher interest rates that we've experienced. NPAT increased 16.5% to $24.3 million from $20.9 million PCP and earnings per share for the half was 16.5 cents, representing a 12.8% uplift from 14.6 cents PCP. There were non-operating items of $13 million pre-tax excluded from our underlying earnings, and these are noted in Appendix A of our presentation today, if you want to refer to them later. I'll now ask Darren, our CFO, to step through the next few slides of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Matt, and good morning, everybody. Um, if you now just turn to page seven, starting with the balance sheet, uh, increasing net debt primarily reflects working capital seasonality, coupled with the impacts of the Avato acquisition. Net debt increased to 97.5 million at 31st of December, up from 76.8 million at 30 June. This was mainly driven by an increase in working capital. Cash at bank of 56.2 million with undrawn facilities of 25 million. During the half, the group undertook a share placement and retail share purchase plan, issuing a combined total of 8.587 million shares at an issue price of $2.25 each, which raised $18.6 million net of related transaction costs. The capital raising was undertaken to preserve the balance sheet capacity for I to pursue previously announced growth initiatives, including further organic growth initiatives, for example, Lasso e-commerce marketplace, support, support further opportuni opportunistic bolt-on and strategic acquisitions in the adjacent packaging sector, strengthen and deepen I's institutional shareholder base, increasing liquidity in the market for IGL shares. <laughs> Proceeds from the share issue and a 10 million drawdown of the group's loan facilities were more than offset by the 15.6 million Avato purchase price, including related transaction costs, associated restructure costs, a targeted increase in inventory and lasso launch costs. Capital expenditure. Our operational asset base remains in excellent condition. Total capital expenditure for group-wide investment and maintenance capex was $12 million in H1. This included Outlays associated with the completion of the Victorian Brayside site consolidation, fit out of the new Earth Earthen Park New South Wales logistics site, and the digital print fleet upgrade and expansion. There are currently no major capital expenditure programs anticipated across the remainder of the financial year, with full year FY23 capital expenditure expected to be around $15 million, which excludes Abate. Um, on the, if you now move to page eight, cash flow and interim dividend, operating cash conversion of 57% to EBITDA on an underlying basis was lower than 78% in PCP. This was primarily due to the increase in working capital, again, reflecting higher activity levels and a targeted increase in inventory paper holdings <coughs> to ensure continuity of supply across the expanded post Avato customer base and to capture further growth opportunities. Aside from the targeted imagery increase, continued discipline management of working capital, including reduced data days and increased data collections over the period. Reflecting the strong uplift in earnings per share, the board declared a fully franked interim dividend of nine and a half cents per share, up 11.8% from the eight and a half cents per share of PCP. The group's dividend policy remains unchanged, targeting a full year payout ratio of 65 to 75% of underlying impact. We will now move through to the business update section of the presentation, turning to page 10. Avato acquisition, reconfirming the integration, timing and cost, revenue and earnings remain on track as previously forecast. I've completed the Avato transaction on the 13th of September 22, the integration timetable and expected financial metrics are unchanged from those previously announced. The integration of an estimated 160 million of Avato revenue into Ives manufacturing footprint remains on track for completion by June 24, and is expected to increase the group's underlying 
annual EBITDA by $20 million and MPAT by $15 million. The integration and associated capital expenditure costs are expected to be around $22 million, excluding redundancies. Included on page 10 is a summary acquisition table. A more detailed breakdown is included in note 13 acquisitions in the financial statements. In summary, for consideration of $13 million, fair value of net assets acquired are $10.3 million, resulting in goodwill and acquisition of $2.7 million. I will now hand you back to Matt to take you through the balance of the business update section. Thanks, Darren. So just turning to page 11 uh, and continuing on the Avado uh, integration piece and update. So during the half, all major Avado customers were successfully transitioned across to IVE with no significant client loss during that period. And as we've already discussed, we've had to increase inventories throughout that period to ensure continuity of supply as well. Staff have transitioned seamlessly with many of their staff now stepping into broader leadership roles as we look to complete the integration over the coming 12 months. So we've been really pleased with the people that have joined our business from Avado. They've got some fantastic people. The expanded business is performing well, meeting all customer expectations and all core business functions within the broader business have been integrated under one leadership structure, including sales, finance, estimating and inventory management. Avado's estimated first half contributions to the group were $60.7 million of revenue, as I referred to earlier, $4.4 million of EBITDA and $1.6 million of NPAT for the three and a half months that they were part of our business during H1. Around $11 million of revenue was transitioned into existing IVE sites during that half, paving the way to close down and relocate key production assets from Avado sites into IVE sites. And notwithstanding equipment and revenue movements, the sites are working closely to ensure optimal efficiency is maintained daily across all production assets, and the business will progressively realign its operational cost base with revenue and asset transfers to IVE sites as we continue to work through the integration. We note at the bottom of the page here a range of key integration milestones, and I'd like to assure you that we are right on track for where we uh, where we indicate we are here and heading into March 23, we will have exited the Brisbane and Clayton sites accordingly within the timeframe that we stated with all key asset transfers done. And we continue to move at pace through the balance of the key integration milestones and are very confident that we will deliver per the plan we've outlined here and communicated to investors in the past with full integration complete in 2024 and full acquisition metrics delivered from FY25 onwards. Turning the page to page 12, just talking about Lasso. So in October, we launched or relaunched Lasso, Australia's leading e-commerce marketplace dedicated to retailers' specials. Independent feedback on the user experience and the net promoter scores is encouraging and reflected in the unique user visits significantly above levels we've experienced before on the old platform. The pipeline for new retailer integration remains strong with a number of significant retailers having deferred integration from the key Christmas trading period to the first half of calendar 2023. And you can see that in the graphic on this page, page 12, the bar charts. Uh, and additions to the platform in January alone have been Carlton United Breweries and Lindcraft. Lasso contributed an FY23 H1 loss of $2.4 million pre-tax, reflecting costs associated with the consumer go-to-market campaign, so marketing, and the build out of the Lasso team. Due to a likely increase in FY23 H2 marketing spend, following promising early platform activity, Lasso is now expected to contribute a FY23 after-tax loss of $3.9 million. Over the remainder of FY23, the management team will focus, uh, focus will remain on bedding down the platform, including completing re scheduled retail integrations, successfully rolling out the FY23 H2 conversion optimization roadmap, and continuing to convert a strong new business pipeline of retailers who want to join the platform. And you can see from the tiles on page 13, the categories of the products that are sold on Lasso and which of those are our 10 most popular categories as well. So it gives you a feel for the broadness of the product available. And as we turn the page to page 14, you get a, a very good feel for the type of brands that are available on Lasso and that customers are going to shop for deals and specials every day of the week. We'll turn to page 15, touch on electricity, energy uh, and gas in our business. 
So IVE is a significant user of energy across its operations with gas only used in one part of our business being the web offset printing operations of the group. The group continues to have an acute focus on energy, both from a market volatility and cost perspective, and more recently with an ESG lens as we develop our targets in line with internal and external stakeholder expectations for the business to transition to 100% renewable energy in the future. We're pleased to announce today that IVE has recently executed a heads of agreement with Iberdrola, one of the largest renewable energy companies globally, and we expect to finalise that contract with Iberdrola in the coming four to five weeks. The seven-year partnership with Iberdrola will commence on 1 January 2024, and from this date, IVE's electricity will be generated from a renewable source, primarily wind. The review and negotiation of the group's new power purchasing agreement, or PPA, comes at a time of well-publicised and unprecedented increases in the cost of both electricity and gas. And our 2022 calendar year pre-tax energy cost, excluding any energy associated with Nevada revenues, was approximately $9.4 million. Given the 31 December 2022 expiry of our existing energy supply agreements and the volatile spot markets, our FY23 guidance released at the conjunction of our FY22 full year results allowed for a $1.25 million increase in the cost of electricity in H2 FY23, giving rise to an FY23 budgeted energy cost of around $10 million. In light of continued increases in the cost of electricity and especially gas, the original FY23 H2 allowance was insufficient. Accordingly, I've upgraded FY23 guidance, which Jeff will step you through in a moment, now includes an additional $3.3 million allowance for increased FY23 H2 energy costs. And we've given you a split there between gas and electricity, giving rise to an unexpected FY23 total energy cost of $13.4 million. From 1 January 2024, the group's new long-term partnership with Iberdrola will provide stable and consistent electricity consumption pricing for IVE. The total price of electricity under the contract will partly be dependent upon the price received for LGCs or large-scale generation credits if and when they're sold. Importantly, pricing under the Uberdola contract, assuming available LGCs are sold at today's market traded price, would see the group's rates for electricity return to around calendar 2022 levels. And while there can be no assurances around the timing of eventual gas price relief, there's a prevailing expectation that the gas market will improve in the near term. And if so, and depending upon timing, this may deliver further upside relative to IVE's upgraded FY23 guidance that Jeff will talk about in a moment. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to all of our staff and customers and partners for their contribution towards what has been a very strong H1 result. And I'll hand back to Jeff to walk through the outlook and guidance ahead of us taking any questions. Thanks, Matt. And just further to the, the slide we just went through on page 15 on energy, we just felt it was really important to provide as much visibility and clarity around electricity and gas, given the focus on, on it uh, by investors and within the business, which is why we uh, essentially spent so much time on, on it in the investor presentation, given the importance and its impact on future years, certainly from 2024 on when the new agreement kicks in. So to finish off with the outlook and, and guidance on page 17, uh, suffice to say a strong interim result, continued momentum across the business and the emerging synergies from the Avato acquisition put us in a strong position to deliver a healthy full year result. Albeit, as you can see from the uh, the waterfall chart on the right and also the comments on power, albeit tempered by a uh, temporary but significant increase in energy costs. So we, we felt it was important in providing this outlook and upgraded guidance to firstly show the uplift in base earnings over our previous guidance that we provided at the AGM in November excluding any contribution from Avapo revenues. We wanted to, to clearly demonstrate or illustrate the contribution to MPAP and EBITDA of the Avato revenues, which is what we've done. And we wanted to clearly illustrate the impact in H2 of the energy costs that Matt has 
just outlined earlier. So the combination of those three things are well illustrated on the right-hand side of that page and, and also we provided the starting point for FY22 for here in the context of the revised guidance for FY23. So the net result of that is a revised full year underlying impact guidance of $41 million. CapEx, as Matt said, expected to be $15 million, excluding Avato and restructure and acquisition costs predominantly related to Avato of around $19 million. Darren touched on the interim dividend of nine and a half cents, being 11.8% up on PCP. And once again, like we said previously, wanted to restate our dividend policy, which is the payout ratio of 65 to 75% of underlying MPAT. So that brings us to the, the end of the formal part of the presentation, other than to thank Matt and Darren uh, and as Matt did, the entire 2000 I staff for once again, a huge effort over the last six months to deliver what the business has delivered, both at an operational level and uh, the financial performance. So we'll now open the meeting up, Tim, to any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Jeff. Um, now, a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, click the uh, Q&A button button at the bottom of the screen and type your questions into the panel. Um, and we may, uh, any of the analysts online, uh, you can put your hand up and we'll ask a question. But we might just start, Jeff, please, with the uh, Q&A button. Hang on, we've got a question here from uh, Jonathan Higgins. Uh, Jonathan, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. And thanks for taking my question. Um, congratulations on the result. Obviously, a lot of things coming together with the acquisition of Ovato and the half and a lot of work being done. So Congratulations to the whole team. I've got a couple if I might run through them. Um, I think firstly, just around, can you just give us a bit of an idea? Revenues have been coming back sort of very strongly um, and sort of ahead of expectations. You're not far off sort of that billion dollar revenue mark actually. So congratulations on that. Um, can you talk about your customer appetite for products and services, Jeff and Matt, and just sort of what power you have sort of competitively at the moment? Yeah, I mean the the uh, customer momentum, uh, Jono, is uh, has been really, really strong right through H one, um, particularly in and around the retail clients. Particularly, uh, if we drill further through that into the uh, the retail experience in store, so we've seen fantastic you know activities right in and around that in store experience, campaign kitting, fulfillment. Our logistics businesses have been extremely busy. The amount of product that they've been onboarding and delivering out on behalf of clients, so. Um, it's not showing any change in momentum at the moment, Jono. And the other point, oh, it's Jeff here, the other point we'd make to the competitive landscape point is we clearly have talked at length about the competitive landscape changing quite dramatically in the web offset space, but equally in the other parts of the business sector in which we operate across the diverse diversity of what we do, we, we have... Uh, far less number of competitors now than what we did 10 years ago. And we hold very strong market positions in each of those respective parts of the market that we operate in. And then when you combine that with the integration or the level of integration of our offering uh, in terms of the number of clients engaged with multiple parts of our business, it puts us in a very strong competitive position. I'll just ask two more if that's okay. So. Just, um, just secondly, just on Lasso, like um, that's been relaunched. That that looks good. Um, obviously, it's loss making at the moment, just with the promotional activity and the like that you're doing. Can, can you sort of talk towards what you sort of expect out of Lasso and sort of the investment you do think you'll have to make in that business or want to make over the next couple of years? Yeah. Look from a from a capex perspective, uh, we other than tweaking or refinements to the platform, there's there's no intention and no need from what we can see to invest any more money at this point because what we have and what we've invested in is completely scalable at this point. I think the question for the businesses is we're tracking the early momentum of Lasso is to uh, the extent to which we deploy our marketing dollars because it, we may in fact make a decision to 
to drive the marketing spend harder if we feel we're going to get bang for our buck and the timing's right. So it's still fairly early on because we only launched it in October. Yep. Uh, so, and then we've had, you know, Christmas, New Year's mixed in there as well. So there's a lot of moving parts, but I think uh, early indications are encouraging. We continue to monitor it closely. And uh, if that means throwing some more dollars from an investment perspective to to, to amplify the brand um, in the market, then that's something that we would certainly consider if it was worth doing. John, we've got a very clearly defined roadmap for that platform as we look out over the next 12 months and all of the development requirements for that platform can be dealt with by the existing team that we already have in the business today. So um, to Jeff's point, it will be literally about marketing dollars if we continue to double down deeper on it because of how well it's going. And can everybody on this call please go on to Last Food this afternoon and buy something for us just to <laughs> check out the user experience and help the help the daily numbers? I will do that, Jeff, as soon as we go and grab the Coles magazine first. So <laughs> just, just last one from me, then I'll join the queue again. Um, just on the gas and electricity point, appreciate the disclosure on that um, for the full year and for the half. You've, you've sort of referenced that you, you potentially could see some upside risk to guidance on that number. Are you... Are you just referencing what you're currently sort of seeing in spot markets at the moment? I think the, the main um, piece of that component that's still quite fluid for us, Jono, is in and around gas. So, you know, the, the, the reluctance of retailers to contract in on gas at the moment, the impact of the government putting that $12 wholesale price cap on actually seems to have caused more chaos in the market. Uh, the regulator has not stepped in yet, but we would expect the regulator to step in soon if we don't see retailers back in the channel, um, providing certainty and contract terms to customers because it's not sustainable long-term for Australian manufacturing to be writing the default rates that are in the market today. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Jono. Um, next question from Chris Savage from um, Bill Potter. Over to you, Chris. G'day. Can you hear me okay? Yes, good. Thank you. Yep. Great. G'day, Jeff, Matt, Darren, and I'm guessing Tony as well. Yep. Um, just... Just around that elevated working capital level, can you give us an idea how long you expect that to be maintained, or should we thinking should we be thinking about that just as the new norm now going forward? Yeah, uh, look, uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. At the moment, I wouldn't say it's the new norm mo uh, moving forward, but it is early days post their acquisition of Avato. Um, so we've had to, as I've outlined in the acquisition. Table, the amount of inventory that we acquired at Avato was relatively low, um, given uh, the size of the business. So we've had to elevate our inventory holdings to make sure that we support and service the client's inventory needs as we do. So at the moment, in the short to medium term, we would expect an elevated working capital level. Um, longer term, we would hope to be able to bring that uh, working capital level down once we get a better understanding of inventory, often in inventory holdings for uh, the new client base. I think the other thing, Chris, is uh, you'd be aware that last year we chartered two ships ourselves and brought in yeah. 20 to $25 million per shipload of paper um, to ensure continuity of supply to clients. If I look through calendar 23, I think supply chains are starting to return to a level of reliability and normality where maybe we don't need to take those sorts of extreme measures moving forward and that will allow us to, to better manage our working capital position as well. If we've got more confidence in the uh, reliability of the supply chain. It's interesting you say that, Matt, because I was just going to raise as a follow-on that news of the Merivale mill closing. So I thought that might be a reason that would, you know, cause you to maintain this sort of level of working capital inventory going forward. Is, is that the case? We didn't take too much out of that mill, so a little bit, but it wasn't a major supplier to IVE, so it doesn't have too much impact on us. I mean, we still should be vigilant on our supply chain. It's only five minutes ago, really, that we had a supply chain crisis that we managed incredibly well that Matt just referred to. And for investors that haven't heard us say it before, paper is as good as cash. It, we can hold paper for two or three years if we want to and we can still use it. Mm -hmm. It's not our intention, but we're in a really solid position at the moment. And as Darren said... It will step down and we'll step it down at the right time, mm. but we don't want to compromise the capacity of the business to deliver in doing that. So uh, we're, in, we're, in, we're in a solid position and we're monitoring it really closely. 
Sure. Thanks, Jeff. And just a second question. Um, forgive me for being the analyst. I know that ink's only just dry on Avado, but you've well and truly flagged that you know M and A still on the agenda, particularly in the paper. Sorry, in the in the packaging sort of area. What what sort of timing? Should we be looking or expecting there some, something this financial year, or should we only be thinking about that next financial year? Yeah, that's somewhat of a leading question, I suppose. I think, uh, yeah, no, look, um, we, we haven't specifically talked about uh, packaging or, or necessarily growth initiatives in the in the deck that we've just been through, but certainly we are mobilised and we're thinking in the next six to twelve months we'd be we'd be out the gate on. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully a, a beachhead acquisition in the packaging space that we've talked about before. But we've certainly been distracted over the last six months with uh, Avato Capital Raise and other priorities for the business. But uh, we are we are mobilised on it now. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Chris. Um, next up, we've got a question from uh, Shane Bannon from Pack Partners. Good day, Shane. Good morning, guys. <laughs> Thanks very much. The um, one of the uh, well, the coming off the market and retailers, particularly, and even some of the marketing group is just want caution going into the next six to twelve months. Uh, Matt, I heard what you said earlier about everything's being quite robust and there's no real sign of any sort of temerity on the part of the, uh, the client base. But I'm just wondering how you. you the noise are you getting off your client base with respect to looking out of next, next little while and um, what he's seeing in terms of uh, you know, wave of demand and that sort of thing and how that's likely to translate back to your business? Uh, when I look across a number of the sectors that we have customers in, Shane, I think about some travel, tourism, exhibition, events, you know, we've seen awesome um, rebounds on that over the last sort of two to three months. So I think some of those those sectors are performing um, very, very well. We're not seeing the retailers as they think about their next financial year plans talking about pulling back on activity at the moment. I think part of that's driven by the fact that we are seeing a lot of consumers flock back to stores. Uh, it's also partly driven by the fact that some retailers are carrying more inventory than what they'd probably like to. So they know they've got to keep the foot down on that marketing spend to push that at the moment. And then obviously there's a, there's a lot of the retailers like supermarkets and so forth that are they're enjoying good momentum and good results and continue to um, invest accordingly in that in terms of the way they engage their consumers. So um, there's no indicators at the moment, Shane, out of any of the clients about any apprehension or slow up as they look out over the coming few months. Great, thank you. And uh, can I also, and just by implication, your commentary about the uh, energy impost going into the next sort of six, 12 months. Um, and ahead of your adopting the uh, renewable platform, um, the suggestion implicitly is that you're not going to be claiming it back off the market and you're not going to renegotiate with your clients. I understood from some of the commentary earlier that you were uh, trying to uh, mitigate the margin pressure you faced over the last six months going forward. I'm just wondering how that translates. Well, I suppose uh, it's Jeff here, Shane. We... we uh, are committed to trying to deliver a consistent margin at the bottom line. So we've got, you know, a lot of moving parts in terms of the costs in our business. Some are more predictable than others like rent, but whether it be labour or energy costs or material, you know, cogs, uh, at the end of the day, it's in the wash up, we're trying to deliver an EBITDA or an impact margin that uh, is sustainable and that, and that we're comfortable with. So part of that includes uh, clearly increasing pricing to maintain a material gross margin along the way. Uh, and obviously with labour, a, a gross margin. So uh, I think, uh, I don't think it's necessarily about answering the question to say we're going to recover every single dollar. It's, it's, a, it's, a complex, it's a complex answer to what would appear to be a simple question. It would be fair, would be fair to say, Jeff, that uh, your position in the market is strong enough to be able to put through price rises without having a lot of, a lot of pushback from the client base? Uh, yes, we've had to put prices up because we have had um, certainly material increases in, in some costs over the last 12 months. We'd like to think 
uh, with improvement in shipping, for example, coming out of Europe and other and, and and what we just talked about in relation to energy, that we might see some of these costs that we've incurred, the increases in costs that have been well documented documented over the last 12, 18 months, start to see them come off. Right. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Shane. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Stuart Turner from Blue Ocean Equities. Um, do, you, do you have a question here? I'll see it in the chat. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, I'm a tragic of the uh, energy market, and obviously this is a critical issue for you guys. And I noticed that the um, dispatch prices have come down rapidly in New South Wales and uh, even more so in Victoria lately compared to their previous peaks. So what sort of flow through, are you able to discuss with your suppliers? And also uh, the LGC market, I, I don't fully understand it. And, and look, I'm not suggesting uh, that you can answer detailed question on it, but uh, given that's a key component of the price, what's your um, experience as a user? Like, what are they telling you? Um, is it the case that there's only, say, 10% of power generators green, so only those guys can issue certificates and therefore the demand is going to exceed the supply and the price is going up? Or how do you sort of see this uh, in terms of from a risk point of view to your business going forward? Look, I, 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 you, you, you um, come in at any point, Matt. I think in terms of the, the numbers in this calendar year 23, which we tried to illustrate, uh, dealing with gas first, we feel we're at a high tide mark when it comes to gas. We, we, we've also, and that could change in two weeks. It could change in three months, but clearly there's a lot of political pressure on this whole gas situation because it is a crisis for households and it's a, it's a crisis for a, num a, a number of businesses. So gas is pretty fluid. It'll sort itself out through the course of the, the, the near future is the term that we use. When it comes to electricity, we're basically locked into a position for calendar 23 on electricity. So we have a, outside of our consumption of electricity, which is um, not really the issue, we're locked in on our rates for calendar 23. So we've got a clear line of visibility on that. And then to the third part or first part of your question, whatever it was in relation to uh, the new contract um, with Ibridrola, Yes, there's a consumption-based uh, price in there, and then there is a price that's notionally allocated to the value of these uh, LGCs, as you refer them to. And to be quite honest, and we've done a lot of work on this, we could sit here for an hour and talk about the LGC market and the LGC scheme and the suggestion that it may expire in 2030 or the government replacing the LGC, LGC scheme with an alternate scheme. Uh, it seems like from our perspective, and you think about it intuitively, it's 2023 now and 2030 is not very far away and this country has to transition by 2030 to a, a renewable footprint. You, you get the sense that these LGCs and the value of LGCs, uh, the value of those and the demand for those as, as companies are running behind the eight ball in making the transition to renewables, that will underpin the value of the LGCs if I've, if I've tried to explain that in the, in, the, in the simplest way, something that is quite a sophisticated, complicated market that I think a lot of companies are trying to get their head around, and then you know, then you overlay that with your BSG, you know, journey that many companies are you know on the runway with. I think we we're we're early movers. I think we're we've we've got out the gate. We wanted certainty. We've partner, we're partnering with one of the the largest global players, which is important. Um, we're a good counterparty for them um, in terms of the profile of our business and us and the. The spend, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I think um, gas come off. Electricity, we're locked in for calendar twenty three, and I think we've got a pretty clear line of sight from calendar twenty four on. Albeit, the LGC market will remain fluid. 
and the forward market for LGC will remain fluid uh, yeah, um, over, the, over the coming years. Yeah, I mean, the, the, sure, the, the beauty of the Ibridola uh, deal is that certainty for the business on electricity spend um, or rates I'm going to pay over the next three months, not with, uh, three, sorry, out to 2030, over the next seven years, notwithstanding the, the LGC situation. And then the optionality for the business to decide at what point over the coming seven years do we want to transition to fully renewable energy and relinquish those LGCs accordingly on that basis and whether that's a, a stepped up process out to 2030 or whether that's a big bang at a particular point in time, that's the optionality that this PPA gives the business to decide on that ESG front um, as we move down that journey further. The project I've got seven wind farms in Australia already, so they've got a proven track record in this market of delivering renewables. Uh, and the project that we've committed into is the Flyers Creek wind farm out in Orange and Western New South Wales here. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you, Stuart. Um, if there's any, is there any further questions from the analysts online? Otherwise, I'll uh, pass back to Jeff for there's a, a written question in the Q&A box. Yeah, there, there, there is one written question which is regards all the moving parts of Arto energy costs and loss. So I, I think, and restructuring costs, I, I feel in what we've been through and in the, the outline of the guidance, we've done our best to unpack the moving, the moving parts as, as best we could. Uh, the question in relation to seasonality, uh, we're always more heavily weighted to H1 from a revenue perspective than we are to H2. And that once again has changed over the last five years as we've become more heavily weighted in the business to retail. So it's probably 55, 55, 45, 45. Yeah, 55, 45. But we're also, that's that's dovetailing in with the emergence of synergies. The complexity is shutting down on the major site in Avato and Re relocating equipment. So this this year has a lot, it, it, it just has a lot of moving parts. So we try to unpack them as, as, as best we can, but that's roughly the weighting between H1 and H2. That's the reason. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that's probably time um, now to finish the Q&A. Um, thank you for being online. Um, if you have any further questions, please reach out to the team and they will be happy to help. Uh, copies of this webinar will be available on the IVE Group and Finance News Network websites over the next few days. Thank you all once again and have a nice day. Thanks. Thank Jim. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good morning.